It wasn't death that was important to the Egyptians, it was life. They really wanted a continuation of this world. They wanted to resurrect. They wanted the body to reunite with the soul and get up and go again. And that was the reason for preserving it. I tend not to say I'm obsessed with mummies. I know other people do, but I'm interested in all aspects. I have been really, I guess I have been obsessed. I admit it, I admit it, I'm obsessed. I have been really thinking about mummification for years, about doing it. So I, ultimately, I, I started reading the texts on mummification to see what really was known about it. And I thought, the only way to do it is to do it to really get a cadaver, a human cadaver, and try to mummify it the way the ancient Egyptians did it. And then we can take everything beneath the stomach out. I'm not a mortician. I'm a professor, and I've been teaching Egyptology for more than 20 years. When the University of Maryland Medical School offered to collaborate with me, I had the chance to do the first Egyptian mummification in perhaps 2,000 years. But it's not going to be easy. We're just amateurs compared with the ancient embalmers. They were so skilled, they could remove the brain through the nostrils without damaging the face. Right there. Right there. All right, let me just get the block and I'm just going to tap it. I want to tap it through. Okay, go ahead. All right? Yep. is in my friend if i was going to be the first to undertake traditional mummification i had to go to the source to egypt i had to find out as much as i could about ancient rituals tools all the special materials like spices, natron salts, and linen. Deep within Cairo's Khana Khalili Bazaar, there's another market where tourists never go. That's where they have the frankincense, the myrrh, all the things I need for my project. The frankincense I know from an ancient Egyptian text goes on the head of a mummy. They used to anoint the mummy with frankincense. The myrrh, all I know is they used it, but I don't know exactly what they used the myrrh for yet. But I'm going to try to find out before the mummification. This frankincense and myrrh probably came from the same place that the ancient Egyptians got theirs from. It comes from Yemen, it comes from the Sudan. It would have been very expensive, and only the embalmers could afford it for wealthy mummies. No one knows how many mummies there are in Egypt, but people were dying for a long time. So there are certainly millions of bodies in the sand and in, and in the earth. Mummification probably began by just discovering that when bodies are buried in the hot Egyptian sand, they're preserved naturally. The, the soil just dehydrates them naturally. So eventually, if the sand would blow away from a body, you would see a recognizable human being that's been there for maybe a thousand years. So they realized that the body could be preserved and was preserved. Everyone in ancient Egypt, rich or poor, wanted to be immortal, to be like Osiris, to resurrect in the West. So everybody had a shot at immortality, and the more you could afford, the better your shot at immortality, the better preserve the body, because the body was going to get up and go again in the next world. It was literally going to resurrect, so you had to preserve it. So all your money, all your thought went into preserving your body. The poor man couldn't put too much money into it. He was merely wrapped, placed perhaps even in a, in a mass pit burial, and would just hope for the best. Try to keep it so pieces don't fall off. 
There are literally hundreds of mummies here in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Nobody really knows exactly how many. But it's one of the best places to come to learn about mummies, as well as Egyptian beliefs about death and the afterworld. The Egyptians didn't just preserve their bodies. They wanted to have backup systems. They didn't want to have just one shot at immortality. So they had large guardian statues to guard their coffins and small servant statues, which would come to life and serve them in the next world. To make the actual trip, they built elaborate coffins painted with an idealized image of the person, and covered them with magical spells to protect the body from harm. Often when people look at these cases and the wrappings, they see the beautiful paintings. They see the gods and the hieroglyphs, but they don't realize there's a human being inside, still looking pretty much like he did 3,000 years ago. And this case contains one of the greatest kings that Egypt ever knew. Uh, Nasri Iskander is the keeper of mummies in the Egyptian uh, Museum. He's been doing it for 20 years and is one of the foremost authorities on mummies, certainly on the Egyptian collection. So, so everything looks nothing, good? Nothing is unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks wonderful. The Pharaoh Ramses the Great reigned for 67 years. He was more than 80 when he died over 3,000 years ago. This is the kind of mummification I want to do. The Ramses mummy shows us just how good the Egyptian embalmers were. His hair was dyed henna. His fingernails were painted. Everything was done for him so that he would look young forever. The mummies of the pharaohs may have been impervious to time, but they were still vulnerable to one thing, looters. It's really a miracle that we have the ones we do. Many of the pharaohs that survived intact were found in a secret cache at Deir al-Bahri. It's isolated and desolate today, as it's always been, which is probably why the royal mummies weren't discovered until about a hundred years ago. It's a good thing they were. They're some of the best examples of the work of the master embalmers. Definitely something for me to strive for. Sometime in the late 1870s, local villagers stumbled upon this hidden cache of royal mummies. The miracle is that they even found this place. The hole was undoubtedly filled in. They probably noticed water running over the cliffs and disappearing into it, and they figured this must be a tomb. Word was sent to the antiquity service in Cairo that a tomb had been found. Not containing one mummy or two, but 40. When the inscriptions on the coffins and bandages were read, they knew they had found the pharaohs of Egypt. They knew they had found Ramses the Great, Seti the First, the great warrior king, Thutmose III, they knew what they had. They had found some of the greatest kings of ancient Egypt. In six days, they took the coffins out of this hole and they brought them across to the west bank of the Nile, where they were ferried across to the east to the antiquity services steamer, and then they went north to Cairo. All along the banks of the Nile, the women of the villages lined the banks and wailed like the ancient Egyptian women must have wailed. These were their kings leaving, and they were also wailing for a legacy that was going to Cairo, never to be seen again by them. Next, will a modern mummy pass the test? Only time will tell. Stay tuned to TBS. News of the discovery took the world by storm. It was the start of mummy mania.
The general public, of course, is always interested in mummies. The mummies draw them into the museums. Everybody knows that. And, and everybody knows the mummy movie. <coughs> Hollywood got the mummies up and walking again, but not in the way the ancient Egyptians ever envisioned. For them, the body was to be treated with great reverence and care. When a king died, he was ferried across to the west bank of the Nile, where the embalmer shops were. The Egyptians lived on the east bank, and those who could afford it buried their dead on the west. The sun dies in the west, so they associated the west with death. And they called the people who died westerners. They didn't want to call them dead. So they had lots of euphemisms. They called them westerners. If you died, you went west. After the body was dropped off on the west bank, the embalmers had to work on it for 70 days. The first thing they did was to take out the moist internal organs. This is to help prevent decay. If you don't remove all the moisture, the body will rapidly deteriorate. Behind, right? I was going to try to pick up the ligament. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well That's down. a stomach. Zip through that. Yeah. Right here, the right? The embalmers were really technicians. They were the ones who knew the anatomy, knew where the liver was, knew where the stomach was, and could take it out through a small slit. Well, I wanted, I want to get it out whole, because uh, I've only seen one other liver taken by, by ancient Egyptians, and it's only a half a liver in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I sort of thought, well, I don't know if you can get it out whole, but I, I think you might be able to. The ancient embalmers didn't leave us a manual, but as we proceed, it's becoming clear what they must have done. There it is. It took a little more of an incision, just a, just a hair, a more. hair more. It was different. OK, Bill, do you have a tray? Each organ was carefully removed and ritually placed in a special vessel called a canopic jar. Well, the ancient texts say that they washed out the abdominal cavity with myrrh and palm wine. So we're just going to do it the way they said they did it. So we've got a linen covering inside the abdominal cavity already. And I'm going to put the myrrh right on the linen. But this is the palm wine. Here it goes. The ancient Egyptian word for wine was erp, like a burp. This is where the Egyptians came to get their natron, which they used to dehydrate the body. In the ancient days, they called it the field of salts here, the wadi natrun. Natron is much better than just salt for preserving something. It's got an extra thing in it. It's got basically baking soda. And you know how you put, um, when you put baking soda in your refrigerator to absorb the smells? This must have helped in mummification. It not only preserved, but it got rid of some of the horrible odor that must have been involved with mummification. For my mummy, I'm going to need a lot of natron. Now I've got almost 200 pounds here, and I'm going to probably get another 200. The mummy has to be totally immersed in it. So I'm going to have to have natron under it. I want to put natron on top of it, then fill the inside of the mummy with little packets of it so that the mummy will dehydrate from inside and outside at the same time. Even Tutankhamun had some of these little packets that were buried in his embalmer's cache. All right, Ron, we'll do it down here. Okay, I'm going to pour it right here. OK, mm -hmm. there it goes. Yeah, you just smooth it in out. a small basement room at the University of Maryland Medical School, we've recreated the ancient embalmer's tent, no, keeping the humidity there. low to be like the dry desert air. Okay. We're just about there. Do you think we can get about six or seven more jars out of that? No problem. All right, Ron, here's the liver. If you can put it on the far corner, and we'll cover it a little later with a little more natron. Now we have to wait 35 days to see if the mummification actually takes place. We don't know for sure if the dehydration will be complete. We don't know if the natron will do its job. Whatever the outcome, this has been an important scientific venture. But there's something else about doing this. Almost defying death, preserving some measure of that human being as he was in life. I wonder, did the ancient embalmers feel any of this? Did they feel pride, hope, fear? I think it'll work, but I really don't know for sure.
Wow. Feet look good, don't they? That's really desiccated. That is good. It's good. Now, take your brush. Let's, let's see where we go. All right, here's the fingers. You know, it looks more like a mummy than I thought it would, because I thought there'd be more moisture. I think we're doing it the way they did it. I never be 100% sure, but I'm, I think this is the way they did it. Of course, I'm grateful to the body donor. It's still a wonderful thing for anyone to give his body to science, and I'm hoping that he would enjoy knowing that this is happening. I don't know for sure, though, but I like to think that he would like it. Finally, we want to finish the process, just as they would have, by anointing the body with oils, then wrapping it in fine linen. If you were wealthy enough, you'd have a priest who's wearing a mask of the jackal-headed Anubis, god of embalming. The priest would say certain rituals over the body as it was being wrapped. Okay, they would good. pour unguents on the body. Frankincense and myrrh would be nice used to time. perfume it. This is right, good. So now... Okay. Now, one of the funerary amulets used for the deceased was a heart amulet to protect the heart. The only organ inside him now is the heart. And this will protect the heart and make sure the heart doesn't speak out against him in the next world. Okay. Let's get one of the magical bandages. And then when it comes out, I think you'll see there's an inscription on it. This has, this right here is the weighing of the heart against the feather of truth in the next world. So it's an appropriate bandage for this area. The magical spells on the bandages aren't really part of my research. I'm interested in the technique of mummification. People just felt we should do it right, do the magical spells too, so we've done that. Uh, and they're, they're accurate. These are, these are what the papyri say should be on it. The hope is it'll be in a medical museum Periodically, we're going to have to sample tissues to see what, what age does to it, how the dehydration continues. So it'll be monitored carefully, and uh, hopefully people will learn from it. it. Looks good. We just have to seal the ends. Seal the ends. I think the care that we're giving to this mummy and the whole mummification process is certainly better than what the average mummy got. There have been no shortcuts for this man, which is good. He deserves it. At the tomb, the last rituals were performed on the mummy. There was the opening of the mouth ceremony, where a priest would take an adze, an oddly shaped implement, touch it to the mummy's mouth, and say a final blessing to give the mummy new life. May the king grant the wish to Osiris, god of the dead, lord of Abydos. May he grant bread and beer, oxen, geese, alabaster and cloth, all things good and pure upon which the gods live for the deceased for your life forever. You are young again. You live again. You are young again. You live again forever. We'll be back with more after this.